So I'm Craig, I'm a PhD student at Victoria University up on the hill, so thank you for coming along today. Um, so I'm going to talk today about a toolkit I've been using for the last two years as part of my PhD research. And today I have my lovely assistant, Daniel Cope, who's a, a very talented master's student who's working in a similar kind of area as me. And in the front row we here have Army, who's also a master's student, and both these students are looking for jobs. So if anyone's uh, got a job on offer, employ these guys, they're the smartest guys I know. So today um, I'm going to talk about Multi-Touch for Java. It's a, um, an application toolkit to be able to write Java applications. It just touch. And so I'm not going to talk about Android, and I'm not going to talk about iPhones. So if you're here for those, just leave. I'm going to talk about Multi-Touch for Java. I want to hear about tables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I can actually say this to you guys, because the last time I gave this talk, um, half the audience didn't actually know what this film was, because they were all like about 18 or 19, and this film was 10 years old. So, so most of you have probably seen this, this is Minority Report. Um, Tom Cruise used these kind of gloves to be able to interact with a computer, and some of it was touch, and some of it was gesture-based interfaces. So when I mean gesture, I mean there's no touch, and there's no keyboard, there's no mice, there's no tactile feedback whatsoever. Um, and you might have just seen, Finally, there's a, like a new thing called delete motion, which there was some stuff that went around the last few days. It's very similar to that, where you have sort of an icon, a sort of a little pin-based device sitting just in front of your keyboard, and you can do gestures in front of it. And the Kinect's obviously another one, but that's another device which is, does some other kind of interaction. Um, so this was one of the things that I sort of thought was really cool. Can I do that? But it's Hollywood, right? And so is this. This is Hollywood too. And this is all blue screen and all fake, so it doesn't really actually work. This one is kind of working. There's a guy who's making a company out of this stuff in um, Boston, but it's really expensive and no one can really afford it. So maybe one day we'll see Hollywood in real life. But um, this story really starts was the 29th of June 2007, and it's the day that the iPhone was released. And um, I don't know if you can see that very well, but there's a picture of Steve. Um, and it's the day I met Steve Jobs. So I'll just quickly watch this film. Cool, so there's me. So <laughs> I got to see Steve for about uh, a second and I managed to get any real. Nonetheless, that was the first real um, conceptualization that I saw of touch, and since then I've been really inspired to do something around touch. And um, I started looking at about that stage, what I could do with that, that kind of space, and there wasn't really an app store or those kinds of things right then. Um, so I sort of had to wait a little bit longer, and hence I started the PhD about a year after that. Oh, sorry, about six months. Um, so besides the iPhone, there's a whole bunch of other devices you can use. So um, the top left picture is the thing called next window of touch displays and they're essentially overlaid touch um, screens which you stick on a um, big large TV screen and they can detect a few touches and thus outside screens are about I don't know, anywhere between sort of the 800 to sort of 1500 dollars depending on what size you go for and you can just whack them on your TV and you can have touch obviously it'd be great if the screen the TV screens already came with touch but they don't not yet um, and then just below that the screen here, which is the HP TouchSmart. You can go and buy those from Noel Leamings or Dick Smith, and they retail around 1300 So they're like an all-in-one touchscreen. Um, and then obviously, you have the iPhone and the iPad, um, but they're really um, a lot smaller than those other devices. And then if we go to the grand scale, that way, you have the touch screens, which are touch-enabled with your feet, it's Papa, and then below that is the big visualization one where you have some IMAX and you can touch the screen and do stuff. So that's kind of touch-based user interfaces in a really quick summary. I'm not going to talk about any of those. I'm going to talk about these things. These are multi-touch um, table user interfaces. So they're not vertical, they're horizontal. And as you can see, they're not single user, they're multi-user. So multiple people can control this, the same interface at the same time. So this whole notion of multi-user and natural user interface you may have seen is, is different than the desktop thing. You have to sort of design the interfaces to be able to support concurrency, to support multi-users, to support different kinds of icons, different kinds of menus and those kinds of things. 
So that's what I hope to show you tonight, um, a bit of the toolkit and how it works and how you can get started. Um, so up on the top right is um, a guy called Jeff Hahn. He gave a famous TED talk about how to make a drafting table um, touch um, interface. It was one of the most downloaded or watched uh, TED talks. That was late 2000, oh sorry, 2006, probably, probably February. So it was some research he did at MIT. And he's now produced a company which produces big 80 inch um, capacitive screens like the iPhones, but really large. And guess what? They're 100,000 US dollars, and only CME and those kinds of people can pay for them. To the right, the, that one the, is the Microsoft Surface 1.0, which came out about 2008. And that was retailing at around 30,000 New Zealand dollars, which is 0708. You can now buy the second version as of a few months ago. Not in New Zealand, but you have to buy it from Australia and then get it shipped. And that's about 14,000 New Zealand dollars. So still not super cheap. Um, yeah, so. Then the one down the bottom is the video that I started at the very beginning. That was a guy who did a DIY table, and I think it was probably, I'm not sure actually how much that one cost. The one on the, this one here is the circular one. It's called React Table, and it's a circular table that allows these um, little blocks of objects to appear on the screen. And they have these little things. I don't know if you can see that very well at the back, but these things called um, Fudishals, or like barcode readers. So you stick these little objects on with these little readers and the computer can tell what it actually sees and then it can obviously update the interface according to something, uh, according to whatever you program into that. Um, so that, that, this is the first one of the first commercial music user interfaces and if anyone's familiar with Bjork, the Iceland um, musician, she actually used one of these devices for a real time performance. She's done it a few times. So I'm going to talk about some software which you can actually use on these kinds of interfaces but depending on the hardware, right? So basically the user interface um, toolkit to be able to write applications so you can deploy them on these kinds of um, table user interfaces. And I've been doing it for about two years hacking with the software and two years building the hardware. So I think the next, what was going on? Right, so what do we mean by multi-touch? So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the hardware just so that people here, because I assume some people are interested in that space. Um, when we mean multi-touch, we actually mean more than two. So dual touch is one thing. So you quite often see products on the market that will just say, oh, we, we have multi-touch, but what they really mean is just two touches. We mean more than two when we mean multi-touch. But it's, it's just probably companies being overly marketing protective. protective. So how do you interact it with, with it without using a mouse and keyboard? You can do these things called gestures. And you know, you have gestures in the, in the desktop environment. You have mouse gestures for your fire, uh, Firefox, so you can change tabs and do those kinds of things. But people don't really see those as gestures because they're now common knowledge. But in a touch into interface, you have these kinds of gestures where you use a, a tap, a single tap to, to select an object. Um, you can group objects by doing a circular lasso kind of style. You can do the famous pinch to zoom, or enlarge, or scale, or um, rotate with two fingers or two hands. Um, so a famous study done at Microsoft Research about three or four years ago um, got, a, I think, about 60 users and they came up with basically 1,080 defined kinds of gestures which you'd want to use on an interface. Um, they created a whole bunch more, but they basically defined it as sort of, um, um, a small set, maybe. I think it might have been about 100 gestures, but they came up with about 1,000 or so. So it's quite an interesting paper and it's quite a landmark. So if you search for multi-touch gestures, you'll come across that paper if you look into sort of some interfaces, some gestures for your applications. But they're sort of some, one, some of the more common gestures that you can use with your iPhones and your other kinds of devices. Um, so um, how does the hardware sort of work? Well, I'm talking about multi-touch optical interfaces, not capacitance like the, the Samsung the Galaxies and the iPhones and stuff like that. I'm talking about using a projector using a camera um, and using non-capacitant surface. I'm talking about um, acrylic glass here. So essentially you stick objects in your fingers and your hands. Yeah. So you can see Daniel here is touching the screen and he can actually um, see, the computer can actually tell where those points are on the screen. Um, and there's a camera that 
tracks where those fingers are, so it basically gives an X and Y point for the specific finger on the surface. So there's a blob, has an ID, and it has an X and Y coordinate. So there's an application that, that, that does that, and that's that application shown you there. It's called CCB, Community Core Vision, based in sort of AI. And then from there, you then stick your client applications on top of that. So if you've got a spreadsheet or a web browser or something like that, you'll stick that sitting on top. It's much like X and X windows and Linux and stuff like that. You sort of have in de decoupling all your database from the operating system. But that's kind of what we're doing here. Um, and then your client application listens for those specific events. So it listens for when the X and Y coordinates are, and it listens to that um, those set of messages that happen and fire over the network. And the protocol is called TUIA, Tangible User Interface Object Protocol. Um, and it's sort of essentially XML packets that are sent over the network. And then we have a projector on this back on this image here. We have a projector that takes the input of the display screen of uh, the computer and displays it underneath it. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, if people want to know more about that, I'm happy to take more questions about that at the end. Um, this is the actual material that I'm using. It's called diffused illumination. It's probably about at least sort of maybe a dozen ways to do this. One's capacitance, and that's obviously not using cameras. I'm using diffused illumination which uses cameras so you essentially have a, a camera here that points up to the screen and it sees exactly where those points are and then you have a bunch of infrared lights which sort of um, help create an even illumination of the, um, the surface so the diffuser material can actually detect exactly where the points are and there's probably about 10 different ways to do that and I lost a lot of hair trying to do that so I don't recommend doing that that's the software, CCB. If you go to that website, you can go and grab that and you can make it run on your laptop and those kind of things. So just so you want to play with it or have a look. Um, it's an open source product and it's the de facto standard that people are using for building these kinds of devices. There are others, and some of them are proprietary. So Microsoft has its own one. Um, the React table has its own one. Um, and inside here, you can calibrate all the different properties. So inside the screen here, we can change the different Thresholds. I won't change any settings because it will screw everything up. Uh, you can change how this, the camera can see things. Um, with, with, we've actually done the light, so it's actually affected by ambient light or natural light. So we can apply um, different filters to sort of stop those lights um, actually affecting the screen. Um, and you can hack a whole bunch of other things to make it work. Um, it captures it, this version that we're using at 50 frames per second. Um, you can get a slightly faster version which captures up to about 100 per second. But we're trying to get it to work about an hour before we can, but we have some issues. But this is good enough. Um, it also, this version of the software also detects these objects here, these fiducial markers, and that software can manage that. So, without further ado, I thought I'd give you a quick introduction in sort of about 10 minutes and then talk to you about this guy, which is the Vulcan Touch of Java, which is why you're here. So, let's run the application. Bring it on, Simon. This is something you can actually touch. And I'll be around a little bit after the talk, so if people want to come down and have a little play or touch or anyone at the time, is going to do so as well. So can you um, pick up on that? Yeah. We'll go. We'll go. So somebody asked me the other day, um, um, can we run Angry Birds on here? <laughs> Nigel's son brings an Angry Birds shirt. So sorry, I don't have Angry Birds. <laughs> <laughs> so it also works with other kinds of objects. It is a bouncy ball that you can bounce and do stuff. So if you just run that all in, so you can see it's actually picking that up as well. It's getting wet as well.
So um, Multitech for Java is an open source project that's developed um, predominantly through the guys at Fraunhofer in Germany, in Stuttgart, and it was released about 2009. Um, there's been about two or three versions, um, and the current version is 0.98. It isn't that the first release and the first, first major release, well, first 1.0 should be sometime this year, according to the guys I've been chatting to. Um, it works with multi-touch devices this big. <laughs> I'm just warming up. Do you understand? Yeah, I was going to switch it three. It's for the house. Yeah, that's all right. Um, so it works with other <laughs> devices, laptops that have those sort of touch in enabled devices. Um, you can see the middle picture here. There's a guy running an iPhone app, which is called Tuio Pad, which looks like this. I pretty much touch the screen here, and you can see that you can interact with the device if you connect it through the network. Um, I won't run it because I tried to make it work, but the problem was um, the whole network here is just screwing it up. But you sort of can interact here. You can't quite see the screen, but you can manipulate the content on the screen. Um, so I use this as my traveling iPad because this is really heavy. <laughs> really big to manipulate. I don't want to use it when I go overseas. This is an iPad one. This is has the cover on it. Can you put the third hand on? What's that? Put another hand on. I think it just, for this one, it's just because it's tiny. One finger. One finger. So, so just to explain this, I mean, in a real world, I, my, I'm the blue puck down here. And in a real world, if I throw my puck down the other end, I physically have to go and get that, right? So in software, you can do things like this. Tap it here and it comes back to my end. So <laughs> I can actually cheat and take this part and chat. Shoot an example. All right, so I'll move along. So I'll describe the toolkit because I want to get into some coding examples because that's what we're here for to show you some stuff. So that was the demos. So what is it designed for? Designed for different operating systems. It runs on Mac, runs on Windows, runs on Linux. And it runs for different kinds of input hardware, so the iPhone, the iPads, the touch dis displays, the next window kits. So the point is, it's supposed to be portable. Hey, Java, right? <laughs> it's portable. Um, it supports those common gestures, which I described earlier, the pinch to zoom, the pan, the selection, those kinds of things. And um, one of the things is you can create your own gestures. So if you want to um, do something completely weird or completely different, um, the, the toolkit allows you to do that. It uses OpenGL as its graphics engine, and so it's built on top of um, processing, which is a uh, Java-like language. Um, that's where you get OpenGL, so it uses OpenGL, which is the graphics language that you want to use. So it makes sense. So it's the most powerful language. And so you're sort of just writing this component really above that um, to, to take advantage of OpenGL. Because writing OpenGL could be the C++ user group, and I don't want to go there. It's the the Java one. Um, so the aim is to create, you know, advanced user interfaces, not meaning that they are actually advanced, but it's just that they're not desktop, so that's what I mean by rich user interfaces. So something slightly different, so as opposed to desktop, which are, um, you click on start down the bottom, or whatever it is, what else, whatever operating system you have. Here you have to think about how do you do that differently, how do you create toolbars, how do you create menus, how do you create those kinds of things. So um, that's kind of what my research is about, how do you go about creating these interfaces, and how do people inter actually interact with them. So if I had given you an iPhone five years ago, I'm sure not many people would actually know how to use it, right? Um, so these kinds of devices, these yeah, large tables are only slowly coming about because basically the cost is quite prohibitive for most people. Um, so my research is to look at how we could use these devices in a workplace environment. And I'll tell you about that at the end, if you're still here. Um, so it's LGPL, so you can write commercial code and keep that as well. And it's SDN access. 
Um, and there's a whole bunch of extensions that other people have done, so I'll show you a couple of those as well. And if you already have Spring applications, um, you can port them to Multitask and Java as well. So how does the architecture look? Uh, so I guess I had to have some technical slides, so this is one of the technical slides I have. Um, you have your basic input hardware, which I sort of briefly covered. Um, and then it's sort of a, if it's um, Windows-based hardware, you can sort of use the Windows Touch um, framework that comes with it. If you're using the device that I'm using, you'd use that TUIO protocol, which I described before. It's basically, basically an XML packets telling you where X and Y is and where you touch on the screen. Um, and then, um, yeah, so that's kind of the hardware aspect. Um, then the processing layer basically is a set of event listeners that listen for events. Um, so if it's a navigation, which is the global input processes, processor, then it would do something with that processor to update the screen according to what happens. Um, otherwise, it might be a component processor. So if you have a piece of geometry, a square, a circle, or a rectangle, or a triangle, whatever, it would listen for those kinds of events and then propagate that to the presentation layer, which we then have these things called scenes. So basically, MT4J is a graphics library, so it uses scene graph technology, if anyone's familiar with that. Um, you have a canvas where you stick objects on top of that, so the objects have to be components, so primitives, squares, rectangles, triangles, and then your UI components, so you're then using the buttons and those kinds of objects. Passes it on to the processing engine, um, and then it just renders it in OpenGL. Any questions? Does that make sense, right? More or less. But you don't have to worry about it if you're a developer, you could just actually just write stuff. So that's kind of pretty much what I do. And there's a couple of papers that describe all that. Um, so it's been tested on these things. Um, Daniel's got a little phone here. Uh, I'm just going to pass it around. That's actually got a port of the language of their toolkit to just get it going. Um, and that's on Android. So they've ported the toolkit to, to Android. Um, they had to do it something slightly different to make it work with processing and stuff. But it works. Um, I'm using Windows 7, so I'm not sure if it works on Windows 8, but it's assumable. Um, and we've tried it on the Ubuntu Linux. Linux. Um, no, sorry, we haven't. We've tried it on Arc Linux, and it works on Arc Linux, because that's the Linux that we have in our department. Um, it uses Tuo, which is a protocol which I slightly briefly covered, um, and it works with Windows 7 out of the box, so uh, Windows 7 touch that is. Um, you can hook it up with iPhones, iPads, digital. Pens, or even Wii remotes. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much the extensibility of that hardware layer. Um, so these are the, the event listeners that I was describing earlier. So on the right, on sort of the left there, you can see um, the different kinds of gestures that you can do in the toolkit. So the top, top left one is a pan. So you can use two fingers to pan left and right or up and down. Um, the right one is a scale or a zoom, depending if it's on the and so you can do the whole gesture, zoom in, zoom out, which we'll show you in a second. Um, and yeah, what else is I going to say? Yep, you can make them happen at runtime if you want. So if you want to um, do these things dynamically, they'll happen. And you can write your own. So I've done a couple of those, but yeah, I want to be showing you guys for that because I didn't do a very good job of it. Um, here is pretty much how the processing event happens. So you get the input um, to source, whatever that happens to be. Does processes the input, the global input processes first, um, and you pass those to the canvas, and then if there's components that are affected, so if you use a pan, then you have to also update where the actual components have uh, moved to on the scene, so the camera adjusts its position. The camera that's in the software, not the physical camera, but the camera which is seeing what's actually happening. Um, and then you have to sort of have processes that are adapted to the components. So here we have objects where you can drag objects around, you can rotate objects, you have scale objects, um, you have tap and hold, which does something. So these are all the different kinds of gestures that you can do on an object. And I'll show you code on how to do all those. Um, and then it basically processes those for a component, and then, um, then basically there's listeners to actually listen for those specific processing events. And obviously it does that. So essentially processing just re keeps redrawing the scene, and that's what MT4J does, it overrides the processing um, app that happens. So 
if you already have processing code, Java code, you can, well, Java code that's UI code, that's you can port it to, to this language. Um, so the presentation layer is basically um, a set of UI components, and it uses the uh, same graph, which is quite similar to all on Swing, um, to be able to whack objects on the same. So I think they didn't want to be too complicated to two left fields, so they tried to keep it simple. Um, well, simple than Java, that is. Um, so the primitives of rectangles, text, which is quite important, especially in my, what I'm doing. Ellipses, circles, lines, and there's a whole bunch more, but those are the main ones that we cover. It uses um, vector graphics, so when you change text or an object, you can use vector graphics. It'll rescale itself nicely, so it won't be all pixelated. You can do 3D objects, which we'll show you as well, and you can display your videos using um, something called GT Stream, G Streamer, but I haven't used that, so I don't actually know much about that. Um, and then you can have some complex widgets, such as menus, keyboards, those kinds of things, which are the more how do we design for a multi-user, multi-design, uh, sorry, multi-touch environment. And the rendering is done in processing. Um, yeah, so I'll talk about that later. So, I'm going to show some code examples. Two downloads, basically a core library. Maybe you see that. So we have a core library which basically has all the main core elements of the toolkit, and then we have a desktop app um, part of the toolkit which basically has all the examples set up. But I've done my own little sample, and I'm going to show you some examples from there. So, so basically, this is the this sort of scene that you sort of want to create a package, you must know that import basic application. Um, we start with scene. If you're not following, just let me know and I'll slow down and speed up whatever, whatever seems. Um, and I can understand there's probably some people in the room that are super down focused. So that's okay, we'll just get to see stuff. Um, so extend the, the main MP application, so it's now scene. Um, we create a main method which basically calls the initialize method, which boots everything up. And then we add the scene. Basically, all of that it is required to get something going is create this application, or sorry, this class here, and then create another scene class, which we'll go to. And um, this just extends the abstract scene, and pretty much this is the scene graph. So we put all the objects and all the um, commentary on here. So it's called the superclass, class of the application, and the name of it, whatever it happens to be. Um, we give a background color, so this sort of things that are global in the environment. So these are a set of blue circles which tell you exactly where you are on the screen. So in a mouse and keyboard environment, we have a mouse and you have a cursor. And the cursor tells you where the mouse is. So how do you do that in touch when you're standing here and going, wow, what's actually happening? You know, what do you actually do? So here we actually have um, little blue circles to tell us exactly where the uh, things are touching. And that's just sort of an indication of how you would go about interacting with objects. I think in the iPhone, Those screens are a lot smaller, whereas here it's a lot larger, so we can have that capability of turning those things on. Um, we create a font, so you can create a bunch of series of fonts that we want. Um, nothing too complicated there. And then we create a text area, and we put a name, we pass it the application, and we give the font. And guess what? We can call it Hello World. Nothing, no surprises there. And then basically we tell it where where on the canvas we actually want it. So um, basically this just says stick it in the middle of the game screen. And then from there we get the canvas and we stick that component on the screen. Is that cool? Anyone not following? Alright, so we run that. And this is what we get. We get hello world. <laughs> no surprises there, right? You can zoom, scale it, rotate it around. So, yeah. Cool. So 
does stuff. Um, so we'll start to build the examples up now to make it slightly more complicated. So the next one I had on the list was, was shapes. So um, so same scenario again. I mean, if they call this the, call the shape scene. Basically, a set of components that we add to the screen. Now, let's take a look at the one here. The one there. And get to the one there. So, yeah, you can see my lines. So you can see it's not super complicated to be able to get a couple of graphics objects on the screen. What's more complicated is to build the application up and doing something which is slightly more useful than the whole world. Is anyone not following? No, I thought we did. We can still keep the way up at this stage. So that's pretty much the basic primitives. There are a few others, but they're the simple ones.
can sit better with a height of image, the image could be a lot bigger or smaller, but these two properties will get from the height of the scale to whatever it is that we want on the canvas. Um, set a position so we can have flatter stick on the canvas. Um, yeah. And you can obviously change, put a board around it, though, do those kind of other properties that you may want to do. Um, yeah, so we have a dog. So I'll just explain what that is. So basically, you then have an empty image, which is overrides the, um, the rectangle. So the image will be now in a rectangle. And I want to be able to position that on the screen. Oh, okay. So the upper left is of that of component. That, that's right. yeah. And then, so when I position that, I will then position it on the scene, and I'll tell it exactly where to position it. So the position here is going by that top left corner. So if I didn't put the anchor, Instead, when the top left point's going down the screen, it'll be 200 by 200 from the x by 5. And obviously, zero is the z, z axis, but we're not worried about that. Does that make sense? Yep. I'm not going to draw a grid line, so that makes sense. <laughs> so run that, and we'll get some pictures of the same. So in, um, in graphics, you have the teapot. Or would the Z actually override that if you set them with different Zs? Yeah. Yes. yeah. So you could control it that way. So is there a gesture to change the Z? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just for So here's a set of lists. So um, when you look at say web pages on a uh, web browser, you know, uh, sorry, when you look at web pages on a browser on an iPad or something like that, you basically can zoom up and down. So they're essentially a list of kind of op operation. So you can get the whole inertia feel. So you can do that in the list there too. So what we do here? We'll give it a width and a height. So that's going to be the width and the height of this empty list component that you see. Um, I think that was right. Width and a height and an X and Y. So it's an X and Y width and height. We then create a layer, which is just a rectangle, and we'll stick the list of names on the layer. I think what I did. Yeah. I did. Um, so we basically now set the list of names relative to the parent. So the parent of this object, which is the list of names, is a layer object. So you can now 
announced that layers and public layers. Um, so we can now move the layer around, which will also move the list of names around. And it just sticks it in a vector 3D position relative to that ground. So we just say get the single point, stick the square up on this layer. Um, then we basically call a method which says update list, which essentially iterates through the list and adds these lists as list cells onto the list. So it starts to get a little bit complicated. So the list now contains these list of cells. And we go and create a set of list of cells and we stick these list of cells on this list object, and the list object has the array list inside it. And each cell now contains a text object. So the text object happens to be the name of this set of boys or girls. And then we stick the list on the cell in the list in the center of the cell. It starts to get a little bit complicated. Um, and so then we basically do that for this one. We do this method for the number of lists, the number of elements that are in the list. And we add that to the list, which I've got as a variable, uh, as a field. Um, and then I've given gestures yet, so I won't explain the gestures. Um, then we have two other, oh, maybe I'll do it now. No, I'll do it in a minute. Then we have two um, text areas, one for displaying boys, one for displaying girls, and then we select either or. I'll just run that, just sort of give it a little idea. So there's the list in the middle there, which is that list of objects. So the red, red box around each, each name is the cell. And so the cell has, a, has, a, has an empty text area. So the name of text is the list of names. Um, and the list size is, is fixed. And then the green layer is the actual layer. We can move the layer around. While Daniel is scrolling up and down the list, I can scale that list up and down. That's right, the layer up and down. And we can rotate it around while he's moving. <laughs> and if you don't want to look at boys, you can, uh, sorry, if you don't want to look at girls, you can look at boys. <laughs> so over now we can change the drawing tool. Uh, change the color. Well, you do want to look at girls. Cells, so the text objects you can then tap those and do something else if you want. But we, I kind of have to show you the way to do So that's kind of how lists work. So you sort of get the whole inertia of something like that. It bounces at the bottom of the list. So it just bounces back. So it has some sort of inertia to be able to push it to it. Set of background color, set of, set of blue traces again, the font. So now what we do is we add some gestures. So now we add some global gestures. Um, here we add a zoom processor. So when we do the whole pinch and zoom, that's what those are. That's what those two lines of code are. Um, and then these two lines of code are the pan processors. So if you want to just pan at the same z dimension, zero, whatever that is, then you can move left and right and up and down. So just add those to Those don't affect the changing of the geometry or the components, but they change where the camera is, where the camera is looking on the scene. We then draw our rectangles again, red, black, or basic. Um, and then now we're going to add some component gestures for those actual objects. So we pretty much, if you looked at that Hello World example at the very beginning, um, we could scale. processes on the object. So we actually want to remove them so we can tightly bound what processing elements we want on the actual objects. So here we'd say basically when I tap the, the black square, do something. So that's what it's saying. Tap processor, add that to that, and then now I'm going to listen for that, um, listen for those events. So when I listen for those events, I capture that ID, I 
set that black object to now be this color, which is silver, and you can define the orange color on the top here. So there's a limited color with RGB and color for transparency. You haven't got your blue circles on, so it's a bit hard to track your fingers on the screen. Yes.
Right, so let's get into some widgets. So, so I was going to show a keyboard. So now, if we actually want to go back to our Hello World example, we can now get a keyboard and actually um, update the text on the keyboard. So how do we do that? We create a font, um, basic font scheme, we build the text Hello World, and now we add a keyboard processor to that object. Obviously, two, key, the two keyboards are there for the two different objects, so um, it would be kind of confusing in a multi-user environment if you had two keyboards changing the same sort of text. I haven't tried that, but that would be, um, just, might just blow it up. I don't know. But yeah. So what I meant to say earlier is the text object is the little text label that I had to add to it. There's this little, there's a little, little yellow beige background color, which is what that is. So add that. And you know, this is a QWERTY keyboard. If you wanted to change it to a, some other kind of keyboard, you can map those keys to whatever you want. So I have that button update to that's all. So that's pretty much a keyboard. This was this one's not terrible. So this is one of the extensions.
this one, which is removed, uh, you can do some kind of actions that you may spawn off another application or you may do something else. In the examples I'm going to show you, it's just going to bounce away and do nothing. So, Essentially, you can basically load a bunch of different scenes. So this, this is the basic scene that we've seen before. I then create a bunch of fonts, a bunch of text areas, a whole bunch of text areas, a bunch of images, and I add them to the canvas. You've seen that before. I then basically create a scene button. So um, when I when you see this, you'll have button, the next scene button, and I 
that's what I did to begin with. You know, three or four years ago, you know, lots of fun. <laughs> I was like, lost the novel for thirty years long. Um, so I built a larger table. So I'll show you one more example. Since we're the Java user group, we better show this picture, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, Daniel was going to describe this <coughs> on this project. He was going to finish off a couple of things, and then we can have some demos that people want to touch on or people need to go to the board. So I have one more thing after this. So this is just one using sort of static controls and you know, they're obviously that will be moving around. And this is uh, this also shows this is a 3D scene instead of the you know with, with 2D elements on it. So you have all your 3D views of three on the you know, six degrees. Yep, so um, I also looked at using the standard gestures so you can zoom in and out using the scale gesture. Circle is just a guide to have you rotate more easily. And you can drag around the pen. And I also, yep. Also, using the same gestures, I did what I call dynamic gestures, where it will record your last position. And then the further you uh, drag from that point, the faster it will uh, rotate in this case, because that's pen. And if you're zooming out, it's faster. So that's just sort of one example of how you can use MT4J. And I, I found it easy enough to use for my models, which was about 400 hours of work. And Daniel actually used a smaller table, so we have another prototype table sitting in the lab. Yeah. Um, when the students wanted to come and do stuff, I said, oh, you can't touch the table, you might break it. So I had to make my other table work so they could break that one. So we had a couple of devices. In terms of my testing, I found that the static controls, for the actual testing process, I had a course that I had people go through and they had to sort of have to navigate through different fields and stuff. Um, and I found that the static control gestures were the best, and then the, I think the dynamic ones were second, which is these ones with the points. Is to go, well, if we can design these kinds of interfaces, how can we design them better? And that's kind of what the research is really about. So I thought I'd just quickly show you that. Um, if you want to participate in the study, click me an email or um, like through the e email that you've got, which is how you've got here, there's a link to me, um, or that's my email address, or if you just type Craig Multi Touch Wellington, it comes up too. Um, and if you participate, we'll give you a small gift as well. So since research is done on Millie Rand, um, we don't have millions of dollars to give you. Um, 
So I understand that most of you are industry practitioners, and that's what I really want to get to. I actually want to get feedback from industry to find out actually how you would go about using this tool. And this tool is actually going to help you understand your software. So I thought I'd just quickly highlight it as we've got probably a couple of minutes left, Angel. Yeah. And then you can kind of see what I'm trying to do. So I've been working on this application for about 18 months now. So, the, so the, the things that I was describing before is what I've been doing. Yeah, that's how I kind of know what I'm doing for. Kind of know what I'm doing. So you can see a smaller version of that same software system. To get the data, I used um, static analysis tools to, to get the data. And I basically got a bunch of text files and then I was just reading those text files. So it's not at runtime. I don't have the classes in, uh, in the actual packages in the, in the clips itself. So that's why. So you can. So I was going to describe this as multi so you can have multiple windows which um, describe show slightly earlier. Um, I have a bunch of other ones. So this one's now something a bit more you know, Java you know, a bit more like Java doc ish. Um, so it's called the Metrics Explorer. So the point is if you want to find um, where the problems are in your code, that's the kind of thing you want to be able to do. So these metrics here <coughs> Number of variables, number of methods, number of lines of code. They're simple metrics that people know about in their software. And so I use those as sort of the base to describe these software systems. So I could select all of those metrics and I could um, and I can sort them. So now I know that this package here, J just sorry, don't, don't drive me nuts. Okay, so that's J unit framework and then inside that you have a set of classes and you can obviously find out which of them. So it's not, so one of the things was this has been set up in my office and I had to move it down so it's not perfectly the way. So these are all the things I do something like this, then I bring up one of those menus. Um, I can then see how this class has actually changed over time. I think it's crashed now. So I still have a little bit more software to go, hence why I'm not looking for people until next month, right? <laughs> so as you can see here, this class has changed from version 2 to version 4.82. There are some more interesting data sets that I have in here. Um, and so that's kind of the thing that I sort of want people to look at and I, I will um, get them to ask a set of questions and find things actually in the data. So it's more of an exploration project rather than bug fixing. And you all love fixing bugs, right? Um, so this one's an interesting visualization. This basically shows you how toxic your classes are. So 
Yeah. 